Okay. I'm making this video for my <laughs> esteemed colleagues, anthropological colleagues in the subdiscipline of archaeology, for the science communicators, and for the general public of my region especially, but more broadly uh, Canada and internationally, all those people who have a fascination with archaeological stories. Recently in the media here, and I don't know how far it's spread, but every time I open my Facebook practically in the last three weeks or so, there's been articles about a pit oven that was, I'm not going to use the word discover, <laughs> that was unearthed by head smashed in buffalo jump here in southern Alberta. And it's thought to be about 1600 years old. And it was intact, meaning that the oven was dug, lined, heated, food was placed in there, was covered, and nobody came back to uh, eat the meal that was prepared. And so in the media, uh, it's being talked about as a 1,600-year-old dinner. That the archaeologists have found. And <clears throat> my understanding of what happened is that the archaeologists called in assistance from paleontologists from the Royal Tyrell Museum to come down and you know in paleontology and when they're unearthing dinosaurs they have to um, they have to move the skeletons from the earth to their laboratories wherever they may be I remember going to the Chicago Field Museum and seeing uh, they had a whole laboratory set up behind glass of Sioux the uh, Tyrannosaurus Rex that they were working on and they had brought Sue all intact all encased in some kind of plaster thing and uh, and then there and then the paleontology students could work you know a little bit at a time with their brushes and their little this and that to uh, to get down into the fossil and clean it all off this is what they decided to do with this pit oven because it's um, a rare find to come across a pit oven that's all intact with food in it and everything. So they want to use the occasion to learn as much as they can about the construction of the pit oven. So they called down the paleontologist to help encase it as they uh, excavated it and then uh, to move it from <coughs> head smashed in Buffalo Jump to the University of Alberta where I imagine they have grad students right now um, carefully 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 working through this pit oven so that they can understand all of the layers of it and everything that goes into creating this pit oven learn something about the past right Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. Well, yeah, you're gonna, there's gonna be something learned. For sure. But at what expense? As soon as I saw the first article about this come on online, on my uh, Facebook news feed, my immediate response was, oh, they just 
took an offering away. Because I am fairly confident <laughs> that whoever made that meal in that pit oven didn't just leave it accidentally. My strong suspicion is that they left it as an offering to someone or some ones who were recently departed. Somebody they loved very, very dearly who they lost and they knew that that person or persons would really enjoy the meal that they were having. And so yeah, while they made a meal for themselves in another pit oven, they made one for the departed in this one. And they left it in there because they're they're giving it to their they're feeding it to their loved ones who are departed. <laughs> That's that's my very strong suspicion. And I have reason to believe that because I've seen this before. You know, Blackfoot communities are very fortunate in that a lot of the old ceremonial complex, particularly the phenological ceremonies celebrating our relationship with the ecology in this place and all the other animals here and the cosmos. All those ceremonies are still very intact here, or a lot of them at least. And the language is still intact here, even after 150 years of colonization. But what is, what was strongly affected was coming of age ceremonies. Um, the ceremonies for boys and girls as they transition to manhood and femalehood, you know. Like my daughter's been through a coming of age ceremony at her first menses. Um, but it was semi borrowed from the Crees, like her grandmother is Cree. And her grandmother and all of her Cree family, the women all have this ceremony still. So we brought that and then blackfootized it a little bit. And so the girls in our family go through that ceremony at their first menses. It's a four day ceremony. It's very special. Um, but only, you know, uh, the, all, the only family that I know of that does that is our family. Um, for boys, I don't know of anybody that does anything that really has the old ways of uh, sending boys out to become men to do that, that rite of passage. So that was lost. Marriage ceremonies in the traditional way were kind of lost. And we're starting to experiment with, with things now to bring some something back or to create something anew uh, for that. The other thing is funerary. See, the church was able to control the children. The church was able to control the young couples being married. The church was able to control the, 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 the death rites. So those things all transformed. Like What I know of Blackfoot funerary um, ritual is that the body is given back. The body is given back to the life system. And in the Christian ways and in the mainstream ways, that's not allowed. You're allowed to either burn up the energy of your body through a cremation or to preserve your body in its death state, in a crypt. 
Now, this is a, you know, for me, this is a very difficult tradition to try to understand, like, what, what's behind that. I don't, I don't, I can't really say that I've got that figured out or that I understand it. I just know that that's what happens. And then that whole death complex from the mainstream Christian becomes extended onto their ways of negotiating other things or or engaging with other things for instance these important historical places like head smashed in buffalo jump if i go to head smashed in buffalo jump and i bring my students out there we go out there we make offerings we go up to the drive lanes outside of the interpretive center and we try to connect with that place as a living place, as Athapisco, as a place with a living presence. We'll speak to that place, we'll feed that place. But when you look at what happens at the interpretive center, which is controlled by the mainstream, what do you see? You see tombstones. They've put up these signs, the interpretive signs. Here lies head smashed in buffalo jump. The Blackfoot were once like this. The buffalo were once like this. And this is what used to happen here. So there's tombstones all over the place. And then there's a focus just like with the entombment of the body. There's a focus on the preservation of the site in its in that particular state, in that death state. So you're not allowed to go to head smashed in Buffalo Jump and move things around, hey? <laughs> and uh, change the site in any way. You're not allowed to still use the site today as a Buffalo Jump. If you want to learn from the site, you're supposed to learn to it, through it in the same way that the mainstream cultural members learn from their dead which is through an autopsy see the way that the Blackfoot people approach these places is that they're not dead they're living they're still they're still living at the P. so they're not approached as dead places but the mainstream approaches them as dead elders and and in order to learn from a dead elder, you have to do the autopsy. And this is done in, in a lot of different ways. This is projected onto a lot of different approaches, like even the approaches of the national park system, the approaches to wildlife. In the mainstream, if you really look at the way that they're doing things, wildlife is considered dead. The ecology is considered dead, and they're just trying to preserve the body. And you're not supposed to engage with it as a human being. This is what happened with this pit oven. I understand the excitement of finding an intact pit oven. I do. Because as somebody who, who values traditional skills, I would want to know how the pit oven is constructed so that I could do it. <laughs> But I wouldn't have to take something like this to, to, and, and remove it from that place, bring it into a university where a bunch of uh, non-native students could carefully use their brushes and stuff and wipe away, you know, eat away each layer and, and reveal this and that. It's not that complicated. A pit oven is not that complicated. And I don't even think um, it needed to be removed from the ground there. I think uh, what could be learned of those layers could have been learned right on site. This is not a fossil that's going to disintegrate when you touch it. This is a 1600 year old 
intact oven that um, if you want to learn something through the autopsy method you could have done it right on site kind of worked through it carefully you know and seen what the layers were that's all that needs to be done doesn't need to be removed doesn't really need to be in interfered with that much if you understand the basics about a pit oven you can go out and make one and and try it and learn some things by trial and error learn how to use a pit oven in this case they took it away and I have a problem with them taking it away I have a problem with you guys taking it away if you're watching I think you should bring it back and put it back in the earth and the reason I got a problem with it is because I do think it's an offering and I've seen it before I did repatriations from 1995 till about 2005 I worked as a repatriation consultant uh, my wife and I we did some repatriations for our Blackfoot communities as a community service we also contracted to the Hoopa tribe of California we also contracted to the Confederated Tribes of Grand Ron in Western Oregon. And one of the cases that we worked on was a midden on the Northern Oregon coast. A midden that had various uh, layers of cultural materials in there. And that was a, uh, a burial mound as well as a midden. And in the 1950s, an amateur archaeologist and his students went into that mound and trenched up parts of it and uh, sent that material to the, to the Smithsonian Institution. And that included over 100 human burials, all the funerary objects associated with those burials, and all kinds of cultural material throughout the midden. And working for the Confederated Tribes of Grand Ron, of course, we asked for these materials to be brought back and for those ancestors to be reburied. And I remember the day that I spent working on the repatriation claim for that, the, the formal letter to the Smithsonian, that whole day I was crying. Because, you know, unlike many of you who can watch Discovery Channel and these archaeology shows and be, you know, have a distance from them, to me, when I was reading about each of those burials that I was asking uh, each of those ancestors to be returned, to me, that little girl could have been my daughter. And I and that reading the description of how she was laid in that grave and the, and the things that were buried with her, I thought it was a, a terrible injustice, a terrible thing that they should be dug up by somebody who had no ancestral relation to her whatsoever. I could see that that older lady could have been my mom. This man could have been my dad. This, this man could have been my brother. This one my sister. This one my wife. You know, to me, it was, it's, when I, when I'm exposed to that kind of stuff, it's very close. I don't, I don't, um, have that luxury of having that kind of conceptual distance to me those are people and the people who buried them were good people and the things that they did in their mourning you know I can feel those things their heart their heartfelt things and in this case along the Oregon, northern Oregon coast one of the things that the Smithsonian said was, uh, well, 
We don't believe that these burials are associated with the tribes from Grand Ron because in the later occupational levels of that midden, there were pit ovens on top of some of these graves. <laughs> this is what the archaeologists argued and said they brought us to court over these burials. And we had three days of court scheduled and we um, we finished in just a couple of hours because what happened was I brought in elders to tell them why those pit ovens were above those graves. And they, the reason that they were there was to feed the dead because it's part of the funerary complex to make a feast for the departed and you put the food in there and you leave it there you don't take it back out of the pit and eat it you leave it there for the for the departed not that different from if you go to any cemetery in the modern world and you find things that are left for the departed on the graves it's not that different And what I think, you know, about this 1600 year old pit oven where the food was left, what immediately comes to mind for me was that somebody was feeding the, somebody departed that they loved. It was part of their mourning. It was, it was part of their relating to the, to the dead. And to me, it's a, it's a crime to unearth those. And I know the archaeologists are going to say, well, we had some Blackfoot consultants. They did a blessing when we were excavating. I'm sorry, but in my opinion, you can never bless grave robbery. That's not what Atsumoyskan is for. I'm not saying anything bad about anyone who is involved in doing that. Because I don't think anybody Blackfoot wanted those things to be taken away. I think it was just a matter of the situation. They were doing the best thing that they could. So they spoke to the ancestors and told them what was happening and wished good things would come from it. But I'm sorry, you know. <laughs> In my opinion, this is just all bad. And if you want to learn about pit ovens, you should make pit ovens and cook in them. And don't, don't go digging things up. This would be as if a very recent immigration population to Canada, like say the Syrians. I'm not picking on Syrians here, I'm just giving this as an instance. What if the Syrians came here and were suddenly fascinated by the cemeteries and didn't bother asking anybody, hey, what's this about? <laughs> they just went in and started digging things up. And they're like, well, there's nobody still related to these people. Like, this was a, this was a, the gravestone is a hundred years old. So it's not like they got any immediate family members still around or anything. There's nothing wrong with it. We're digging it up and we're learning things from it. We're learning how things were a hundred years ago. <laughs> I'm sorry, but this is not, this is not appropriate. And the autopsy method the autopsy methodology of learning that goes with archaeology in general is not appropriate at any Blackfoot site ever. That's not how you learn from these places in a culturally appropriate way. 
this is just my opinion. I'm sorry to be like sounding like I'm on a high horse or whatever, but I I gotta express this because it's it it's upsetting me. You know, this morning I saw another article about this pit oven on uh, Facebook, and when I opened the article and I scanned down and I read the comments too, I saw that the comments, all the comments were just really ugly things. You know, from the general Joe Blow Canadian public who thinks he's being comedic comedic but <laughs> it's so sticky you know most of the uh, well not most but a good portion of the feedback on the site is that is these people trying to be funny by saying Oh, the natives just went out and got drunk and they forgot where their pit oven was. So they're just using it as a as a method of um, recapitulating racist sentiments. What good is this excavation going to do for Canadians? What good is this excavation going to do for the relationship between First Nations and Canada. This is just another instantiation of the mainstream taking ownership of something that's not theirs and treating it in this very bizarre way in my opinion. You know what it's really like to me if you want to know, have you, have you, have you ever seen that um, Tim Burton's Nightmare Before Christmas? In the night before Christmas, you got Jack Skeleton, he goes to Christmas World or whatever, where Santa Claus lives, and he sees all this beautiful other culture. And then he he bags some of it and tries to bring it back to Halloween land and tries to communicate some of that other culture to Halloween land. But the but the the creepy creatures in Halloween land they're so wrapped up in death and violence and all of this stuff that they can't see that beauty. So to them, it's just really bizarre stuff. Like, I think I remember Jack Skeleton brings out this present, you know, this box wrapped in gift paper. And the other creatures are like, ooh, what's in there? Perhaps it's the head that we found in the lake. <laughs> Which is not far from the truth. You know that one time when I was working repatriations from Grand Ron, a, a mem uh, an archaeologist from the Peabody Museum at Harvard brought to my house a human skull in a, in a hat box with a, with a red bow on it. They thought that would be the appropriate way to bring it, to present it to me. True story. I remember Jack Skeleton brings out the stocking, the Christmas stocking. It says they hang this from the chimney. It's a sock. <laughs> and the other creepy creatures are like, what's going on with that? Is there still a foot in there? Is it severed off? Is it rotting? Let me look. <laughs> To me, this is what you archaeologists are like. This is exactly what you're like. And the mainstream public, and the science media, who are all wrapped up in this death complex, who cannot, for some reason, approach these Blackfoot places and other First Nations places as living. You only see death and violence and gross things. And so you have to approach these as dead things. Well, this, this pit oven that you, you know, unearthed, to me, first of all, that's not yours. That's not yours to unearth. It's not mine either. It belongs to the ones who were fed by that offering. And you just leave it. You're not supposed to go take it. And if you recognize that you maybe made a mistake, 
then you make amends for that mistake. Bring it back. And not only bring it back, make a new offering and make amends. That's my opinion. I think it's far more important to do something like that to teach the public something that needs to be taught than to have a couple of grad students in archaeology get the experience of carefully digging through this thing that's not yours to be digging through. Again. Yeah.